stand with us this morning as we worship him. One, two. Grow Point. How y'all doing today? Turn to somebody. Give them that fist bump. 
Turn to somebody, at least hit knuckles with somebody. Don't knock each other out, right? Hey, we're so glad that uh, we can gather here. What, what blessings we have in our country that we can gather and not be afraid. We can worship God freely. You know, there's millions of followers of Jesus that are meeting today, just like we are. Some don't have the, the same circumstances that uh, we have. It's more difficult for them. But we are all lifting up the name of Jesus. And I think that's pretty cool when we kind of look at the broader picture, the bigger family of God, of what's happening today. Uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. We know that it can always be awkward being the first time, but we just want to welcome you. And you should have received a grow card as you came in. If you did not, there should be one in the seat pocket in front of you. If you would just simply fill that out, take it to the area right out the front door called New Here. We have some people that want to learn your name and uh, give you a smile and even uh, give you a, a gift. Um, throughout this week, you'll get an email from us. We promise not to spam you, okay? But you'll get an email from us and you'll have the opportunity to choose from 10 different uh, local charities here throughout Lorain County uh, that we partner with. And we want to make a donation in your name just by uh, you visiting with us today. And so you'll have a chance to, uh, uh, to respond and tell us which one that we can do that. So welcome so much. Everybody else, you're good to go too, okay? Don't forget that grow card. You'll need that at the end of the service. Pastor Josh will uh, refer to that. Uh, before we jump back into worship, there are so many new families with us that we've had a couple inquiries and that we wanted to spend a little housekeeping this morning and talk about what does it mean to give at Grow Point. Okay, we're, if you've been around Grow Point for any, any amount of time, you'll know we are not a high pressure church when it comes to giving, right? We believe what Paul said through the prompting of the Holy Spirit in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, nobody should give under compulsion. Meaning you shouldn't be manipulated in any way. You shouldn't be compelled in any way to give. Here at Grow Point, we give because we are grateful for what Jesus has done for us. We want to give out of thanksgiving, right? Out of the cheerfulness and, and thank you, God, what you have done in the past. You've saved us, but also what you're currently doing. And we're trusting you with our future. That's what uh, giving here at Grow Point looks like. And, and so if you have any more questions about that, you can come and see me. A couple ways to give. There are offering envelopes in the seat pockets in front of you. And there are offering boxes attached to that back wall. You can simply put your offering in there. You can drop it. Some of our, our sanctuary hosts might have a basket at the end of the service. You can drop it in there, but we're not going to be passing the basket uh, through, through the rows there. So um, you can also give online there uh, at growpoint.church. You'll find some uh, um, uh, buttons to push and it'll take you to, uh, to those areas. Um, but again, we give because we're glad. We, we're, we, we give because we're thankful. I was reading in Psalm 134, and David said this. Well, actually, will, will you lift up your hands like this? Just, the, you are fulfilling scripture right now, okay? Because I found in, in Psalm 134, David said, let's lift up our hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Okay, so whether the world or some, some politics or something has tried to steal that action away, sometimes that feels weird for us to lift up our hands. But it's, it's actually just a way of expressing thanksgiving to the Lord. It's a way of, of, of getting our bodies, not just our mouths involved, but actually giving our hands something to do, lifting them to the Lord. So will you lift up your hands and let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Dad, thank you so very much. We have so much to be grateful for. Even in those difficult times, in those valley moments where there's a bill that needs to be paid or there is some uncertainty or, or some difficulty. In fact, David said, it's though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. 
right? It's in those moments that we also can say we don't have to fear any evil because you are with us. And so we lift up our hands in praise. We lift up our voices today in praise out of thanksgiving. We join the millions of others around our world that are declaring Jesus, that are speaking his name and, and singing praises. We pray that it would become like a like the Apostle Paul said, a, a sweet fragrance would rise out of this place and maybe even go into your throne room and that it would be just a sweet savor in front of you. But then you do that amazing thing when you come and you inhabit the praises of your people. I don't understand how that works, but if you'll draw close to us, Lord, I, I'm all for that. You said if, if we would draw near to you, you would draw near to us. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to lift up our voices. We're going to lift up our hands. We're drawing close to you. We love you. We praise you. And we offer all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
speak the name Jesus right now. Jesus. Jesus. chains I won't let the enemy take hold no more those chains are broken in the name of Jesus yes those chains are broken in the name of Jesus
You know, before we get into the message this morning, we each have struggle, we each have shadows, there's, there's, there's just stuff. And um, it'd be good to be the church for each other. And before we, so often we um, fall into this lane of, I mean, we just need to stick to the script, but I want to invite us this morning, if you could... Um, how many could identify with that? Like there's just, I got something that I'm either walking through or I'm facing, or there's just a heaviness. Um, if, if your hand, I, I don't know how to do this other than, we're just gonna do instrumental here as a backdrop, but I, I wanna just release us as a church family. Um, those of you that raised your hand, just find someone and say, hey, here's, here's my shadow, here's my struggle. And we're just gonna take the next few minutes and, and cover each other in prayer. Can we do that? Yeah. Let's, uh, so just turn to one another, share what's going on in life, and uh, let's be the church, church over one another, all right? Let's just pray.
Father, every shadow, every struggle, every challenge, whether it's what people are walking through or what's right around the corner, we speak Jesus. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our strength. Jesus is our healer. Jesus is our wisdom. And so, Father, we, the full measure and the full scope of what comes through the name of Jesus, we, we speak that over every situation. Father, we pray in those moments where it seems like hope is shaky, that we would be brought back to the strength that is in the name of Jesus, the power that is in the name of Jesus. So Father, we love you and we thank you for the hope that you give us in the name of Jesus. In all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, y'all, it's, uh, it's good being up in here this morning with y'all, and um, it's just good to, to encourage every now and again. I'll, t- I'll tell you, over the last several weeks, reading through the, the responses on the grow, the grow card, um, from a pastoral standpoint, y'all, y'all have just been really raw, and... Um, acknowledging and speaking to, um, even, even this past Sunday, the question was, what, what house of cards do we have a tendency of going back to that Jesus already has taken care of? And But for what it, one, one reason or another, we keep running back to that house of cards that he's already like, listen, that's, that's not where you need to live anymore. And so there's just... Um, some rawness to, to the responses. And then the week prior to that, if you all remember, there was the, um, this will sound funny for anybody that it's your first time, and so this will sound so out of context, and I just wanna go ahead and apologize for the way this question is gonna sound. But Paul talked about offering the members of our body as instruments of righteousness, and so we wrote down, God, what body part can I offer you this next week? And, um, and so, the, the mouth was, by and large, the most common that was written down. And so I, I speak to that, um, one, to encourage you in, in the way that y'all have been responding on the grow card, like it, there's just something significant about um, responding and, and what y'all have been willing to acknowledge and, and write in response to has just been so, so good. And, um, and I'm believing and I'm trusting that the power and the presence of the, of the living God is, um, is right there beside you to comfort, to strengthen, to, um, to be your source of um, hope. And really that's, uh, it's, I, I love how our, our, our times of worship happen sometimes. There's, there's times like today where I'm like, you know, we could just, say amen and walk on out of here because that, that was the message, like from the start. So take you at your word. I just wanna ask us this morning, do we take him at his word? Um, it's one thing to say, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I do it, but then when those shadows overcome and those struggles come along, it's amazing how fleeting that thought of taking him at his word is for us, at least for me. Um, then there's the, uh, obviously the power that's like speak in the name of Jesus, right? Speak in the name of Jesus over everything. And so this morning as we get in, we're going to continue with, with Romans and there was a place that we were brought to this last week. And it's interesting how we keep coming back to, to Jesus, um, that's why we're together. That's why we gather together in this facility and in this place. We are a body of believers in Jesus. We believe that he is the son of God. We believe that God sent him to us, for us, 
and that the life he lived, the death he died, and the resurrection that, he, that was accomplished was all for us. And so in that moment of what he did, everything centers on that. So everything, all of our hope, all of our healing, all of our strength, all of it is hinged upon Jesus. Can we say amen to that? And so it's no surprise that as we've been going through this conversation about grace, as we've been going through this conversation, um, even as we were going through Acts, it, it all comes back to Jesus. And so this morning, what I wanna encourage us to do is, let me backtrack just for a second. At the end of last week, we come to this place where as we were building our life on this house of cards, Jesus came along and was like, hey, let me handle this because there's, there's, um, it's, 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 there's a fallacy to that strength or there's a fallacy to, to this structure that you're living within. And the Bible even said that he condemned it. He declared it a con- condemned structure to live within. And as we come in Christ, we become God's children. Now, we can land just on the good of that and be like, man, it's good to be one of God's kids. And previously, God used to, me and God, we were kind of like strangers, but now I get to call him Abba Father, and he calls me his child. And we can land on the good of that, but he concludes that section by saying, if we share in Christ's sufferings. So this morning, the, um, the focal point is this tension that real time right now we live in of living in the, the reality of struggle and hardship, which I, I imagine we all at different seasons of life and some of us are living a struggle and hardship right now. Some of you have lived it, it was past tense now. But regardless, this life that we live, there's, there's a unique struggle to it. And we live within this tension of struggle and hope. Now, um, how many of y'all, when you're going through struggle, had somebody come up and be like, listen, God's working good in it? Anybody ever have that happen? And you're just like, you, you wanna tell them to be quiet? Like, I don't wanna hear that. I'm, I'm going through something here. I don't wanna hear this right now. But if we take him at his word, we will know that in this tension of struggle and hope, our Father in heaven is working for our good. Can y'all say working for our good? We either take him at his word or we don't. And so this morning, as we continue in Romans, I wanna invite you to turn to Romans chapter eight. We're gonna pick up in verse 18. I wanna provide a backdrop, though, and and read verse 17 just as a reminder to kind of jar our memories from last week. But we're gonna dive into this, and I'm I'm just gonna be honest with you up front. There's gonna be a lot of the morning that, that it's like, okay, we're talking about, Paul talks about suffering a lot, a lot of groaning a lot. And, And the fact that we live in the reality where the experiences of our life are grown worthy, okay? But through that, there is still the reality that we are in Christ. There is a hope that we are living in now and a hope for something that is yet to come. So this morning, um, here we go. Y'all ready? In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. But let's start first in verse 17. It says this, now if we are children, then we are heirs, and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So there's, again, Paul is speaking about that tension that exists, that now that we are in Christ, that's a good thing. That's a good thing to be in Christ, but there's, there's just the reality that we're sharing in his sufferings so that we also 
share in his glory. From that place of being a child of God, being built on Christ or in Christ, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to frustration. And I'm just gonna, let me just let you know, we're gonna read through verse 30, and there's a lot of wordiness of what Paul spells out here of, of the different layers of struggle and suffering. All right, and then we're gonna come back around and, and hopefully work through it in, in a sensible way. The creation waits in eager expectation for the, sons of, for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, um, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in the hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as children of God, which is the redemption, the full scope of that is the redemption of our bodies. For, oh bless their heart. They're feeling the pains as well. So here we go. For in this hope we were saved, but, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We'll come back to this. We do not know what we ought to pray, pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with the will of God. And we know, here's that verse, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, for those who have been called according to his purpose, for those God pre or for those God foreknew, he also predestined. Don't worry, we're not gonna preach a sermon about, about predestination for any of you that are, have, have been stumped up on that one before. He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son that Jesus might be the firstborn among many siblings. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. There's a lot that Paul is saying in these verses. And that he, he's spelling out this tension that exists even when we no longer live in the old structure that Jesus condemned and he not only just put the signpost on it, he actually went to the cross to handle all of the deconstruction of that old structure so that we can live our life in Christ. Now, what, the reason why Paul is spelling this out is he, he's quickly wanting to help people understand that when you begin a relationship with Jesus, it's not being um, invited into this reality where there's no bumps or bruises along the way. So many have, um, and this may be an old analogy, but I remember hearing people say that they treat Jesus like a lucky rabbit's foot. And like once I become a, once I become a follower of Jesus, then I'm just gonna kinda like rub on that foot and then it, life's gonna be good and there's not gonna be any struggle, there's not gonna be a heartache or hardship and Paul's like, that's bad theology. It's actually just bad understanding of the reality that we're living in right now. There's going to be struggle. There's going to be suffering. And again, I, I lo like, let me just remind you, I'm looking out at y'all's faces and, and what I have the privilege of like at real time right now, I don't just see your faces, I see the story behind the faces. I see stories of struggle and heartache and heaviness, shadows that you're walking in. It's like, my goodness, when will the cloud lift? Come on, come on. I just want you to know what I see. And I think it's so important 
to be reminded of the hope that exists in Jesus as we walk through the hardships. And I, I get it. I get it when people would be like, man, I just wanna get to heaven. I get it now. When I was a kid, I used to be like, what's wrong with them? Why are they so eager to get to heaven? Like, earth is not a bad place. This, this isn't the, all that bad. And then you start gaining experiences of trauma and drama and where your heart is crushed or pierced and, and it's just, man, this, this is hard, this is heavy. This, this is real. And I'm saying all of that as a follower of Jesus. I thought, I thought he was this, I thought he was that. It's so crucial for us in these days that we live not to lose heart. There's goodness in the reality of living in Christ, following Jesus here now, knowing that it's, it's kind of hard to spell out. We can enjoy the benefits of eternity right now while living in what's temporary. And so there's gonna be a day that's coming and we have this anticipation, right? I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but, but Paul, he, he, he's writing about this so that we don't lose hope. Just because we are followers of Jesus, just because we are placing our faith in Jesus does not mean that we are removed from difficulty. And I consider, he says this, how crazy is this? I consider our present sufferings not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's a strong word, because I don't know about you, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard some stories, and I know there are some represented in here in this room, like stories of loss, yeah. stories of heartache, stories of, and, and these aren't even stories, these are real life realities of, of even Jesus. expectations or hope about this individual or that individual, my children or my parents or, or whatever, and, and those expectations that I had are not what's being lived out right now. And my heart and my mind doesn't know what to do with it. And, and Paul has the audacity to say, our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that's gonna be revealed. Now I think it's so interesting that he writes it this way. The NIV translates it where it's a, it's a glory that's revealed in us. Like, what does that even mean? Like, I know I, I love Jesus. I know that he is my savior. He died for me because I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I needed saving. And there's a work that he has done and he's continuing to do within me. But there's still yet to come a glory to be revealed in me. There's a glory yet to be revealed in you. Like, like that phrase alone, what does that mean? I don't know fully because I'm a human being and I've got limited understanding. All I know is that the goodness that I'm experiencing of God now is restricted by time and by just, there's just limits all around. We are approaching a day that is gonna happen where there are no more restrictions. And the full measure of us being children of God is going to be revealed in an instant. Like, and Paul isn't just buttering up his audience here. He's speaking truth, saying that our current struggle, our current heartache, our current reasons that we cry and feel pain pale in comparison with the glory that is to come. Amen. He's not diminishing the struggle, he's just saying the struggle isn't the full story. No, no. I consider present suffering not worth comparing to the glory that's, come, that's to come. That means that there's a glory that it already exists but we don't fully 
see it. And it goes on, he says this, that even creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. He, he's personifying the created world as if the created world were a person. And the world itself, like have you ever just, this is a weird thought, okay? Have you ever just looked at an old, old tree and thought to yourself, I wonder how many stories that tree could tell from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. <laughs> And here I am living in my 44 years of wisdom, and I'm just thinking, how much wisdom could that tree, how many stories could that created plant tell? The creation, it's such a weird, um, such weird language that Paul uses. But the creation, is waiting in eager expectation for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. And the creation was subjected to frustration. So Paul is saying even the, the created world isn't living within the reality of what it wants to live within. This is like jumping to the book of Revelations and and, and, and diving into those verses that talk about a new heaven and a new earth, like the created world that we are living in right now, even it, he says this in a minute, that it groans, kind of like pains within childbirth at what's to come. And so he's, he's saying this, there's a lot it's like no matter what level you look at, there's groaning and aching and pain where we are currently living. How amazing would it be? And I said this a few weeks ago. How amazing would it be if the moment we said yes to Jesus, it was just like we just like, um, what's the word, teleported into heaven, right? Like I believe in Jesus, he's my savior, and then pff, we're, we're done. Like we just go. I think people would say yes to Jesus a lot quicker, don't you think? Like, Bob, like Bob was here last week and he said yes to Jesus. Now he's not here anymore because he's with Jesus in heaven. Let's be like Bob. I don't know why I said Bob, but anyways, like so. I don't know if any of you are like me. Like, like I've asked myself the question, like why, why are we remaining in the struggle? There, there's purpose behind it. There's something that's supposed to be happening within us in and through the struggle, in and through the sufferings. And he spells that out for us, but I don't know that we like to, to hear the, the method of what's supposed to take place. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in the hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom, the same place that the children of God are gonna step into. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. What was Paul observing? Like, did he, did he feel an earthquake? Did he see a volcano erupt? Did he, like, what, what birth pains did he see demonstrated through creation? We see it today. I mean, every other day, it's like a new hurricane is forming. We, every other day, there's, there's earthquakes. Everybody that lives out or like has talked about California, it's like they're just one earthquake away from it falling off into the ocean, right? So it's just like, it's like we're waiting for, even creation is waiting for something. And in the process of waiting, there's this ache and pain in the process. Not only that, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, meaning this is, they're like generation one of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, okay? So we have the first fruits of the Spirit. We even, now that we have the Spirit of God within us, listen to this, now that we have the Spirit of God in us, we groan 
inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the full redemption of our body. I don't know how many of y'all, the older you get, the more eager you are about the redemption of your body. Is it working the way you want it to be working? Aren't you, aren't you looking forward to the day where it doesn't pop and creak? Like, legit, every, we're just, we're no different than the world. We're decaying and, <laughs> it's such an uplifting message from a pastor. <laughs> like, just every passing day, we're getting more decrepit. Hair's falling out. We, we lose hair where we want it. We grow it where we don't want it. My barber has the audacity to run his clippers over my eyebrows these days. Like, when did that start happening? I didn't know they needed to be kept high and tight. So there's just realities within our physical bodies that's just, is it happening to us? I can't wait for the redemption of my body. Our soul has been redeemed. Our body is waiting in eager anticipation. In the meantime, it's just gonna, and if we don't groan through our mouth, our body is gonna groan in other ways, right? <laughs> and that eager waiting, he says this in verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. We weren't, it's not that we were saved by hope, but as when we step into the saving relationship with Jesus, we are saved into this hope. There's, there's something that we've yet to step into. And that's, that's so good for us to be reminded of because we're gonna keep facing shadows and struggles and heartache and hardship if not as a culture, if not in our community, if not in our relationships, we're gonna, some kind of hardship somewhere along the way is gonna come. But we have a hope. We have this hope. He says, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. So there's a reality of what we're living in right now that we see. There's goodness, like I, I love, this is, this is an example. When an individual gives their life to Jesus and says, yeah, I wanna give my life to him, I wanna live my life for him, my life no longer belongs to myself, it belongs to him. And so I wanna live according to his purposes. When an individual makes that decision, there's a life that is birthed within them that is seen right here and right now. There is a joy, there is a delight, there's, there's just a new life. That's why they call it to be born again. I love watching that, seeing that tangibly take place where an individual is born again. So we don't, we don't need a hope for that anymore because we see it. But there's something else that is to, be taken, that is to take place down the road and that's, what we're hope, that's where our hope is. We're not hoping that it happens. We, we know it's gonna happen, we just don't know when. And that's the hope in which we were saved. If we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. I think that is one of our biggest struggles is that, uh, I don't know about you, I, I wait, I have a tendency of waiting impatiently. I may give the appearance that I'm calm, cool, and collected, but on the inside, I'm like, who, who needs to, move things along here. <laughs> or like when somebody in front of you is being ridiculous and you're looking around to be like, is anybody else seeing this crazy train right now? <laughs> so there's all kinds of examples of like how we have a tendency of waiting impatiently. But this, this hope that we are to experience and I, again, I wish that once we said yes to Jesus, we were just right there. But we have, there's life to live. And we'll just keep on going because there's a purpose in this. In the same way, the Spirit 
helps us in our weakness. Now don't jump to thinking that weakness means sin. Because he says this, we don't know what we ought to pray. Paul says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The weakness is our capacity to pray. There are times in life where our struggle and the pain that we are experiencing hits so hard that we get discombobulated. And we don't know how to pray. We don't know what we're to pray. Some of those hardships could be, God, do you want me to go here or do you want me to go there? What, what, what do you want to do through me? Where do you want me to go? Sometimes that can hit really heavy in people. Like, I want to live according to your purpose. I just don't know what it is. And like, I could go here, I could go here, I could go here, I could go here, I could go here. And that just paralyzes. There are other times where it's, like, it's more like trauma or, or just stuff that comes along the wayside. Um, one of the ways that we are like the creation, so it says this, that, that creation was subjected to frustration. How many of you could identify with that? That the frustration that you feel, you were subjected to it, meaning it wasn't your choice? So the life we live, we are gonna continuously be subjected to frustrations that we didn't ask for. And as we walk through those times, we don't be surprised when we are so disoriented that we don't know what the right prayer is. And we need the presence of the Holy Spirit within us to help us pray. And why is that? Well, because the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. I know Pentecostals, Charismatics would be like, that's, that's, that's uh, speaking in tongues. Maybe so. But I think there is, there's just a, an intensity and a desperation and an such a massive heart that, and this, this will get really muddled up, and so I, I apologize if this comes out really muddled because I'm still confounded by the Trinity, by the way, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But the heart for humanity that our living God has is so strong that the indwelling Spirit groans on our behalf with words, with, with groans that words can't even describe. And it's not groans of frustration, like why can't these people get their junk together? It's groans of like my heart aches for them, my heart aches with them. And, and, and I don't know how the Holy Spirit addresses the Father, but there's intercession that Holy Spirit is communicating perpetually to the Father in heaven. In those moments where we don't know how to pray, maybe we don't know how to pray because we're so frustrated. Maybe we don't know how to pray because there's so much pain wrapped up in it. Maybe we don't know how to pray because we're so confused. Whatever the reason is, how much, how much confidence should we gain knowing that the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf? That means that even when we can't fight, we have one that's fighting for us. When we, are, when we are muted, we have one that is unmuted and interceding for us. And only until you get to a place of desperation will you ever understand how important that is. We do not know what we ought to pray. Therefore, the Holy Spirit helps us in, our we in that weakness. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And then he who searches the hearts, that would be our Heavenly Father, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. So he's searching our heart knowing that the Spirit is there. The Spirit still interceding for the saints in accordance with God's will. So 
that's another layer of the importance of the Holy Spirit interceding on our behalf is that the Holy Spirit is interceding according to God's will. That means that the struggle that we're going for that has rendered us confused or muted, Holy Spirit is interceding for us according to God's will. What is God's will? Well, it's good, first of all. And he, he uses the, the, the last portion of this to, ex, to explain the depth of God's goodness. So on that, on that train of thought, so we're still building blocks, so we're in Christ, we are sons and daughters of God. We are his kids, we get to call him Abba Father, Dad. If I could give any pastoral encouragement, like just get over the discomfort of addressing him as dad. If you, if you have a relationship with Jesus, call him dad. That's what Jesus did for us. So now we get to call him dad. We put on another block to this building. In, in all of the goodness of being able to call God dad, we're still living in the reality of heartache and hardship and struggle. I don't know how to pray over what's going on here, but the spirit within me is interceding for me according to God's will. What is God's will? Well, this next verse says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. I, I'm not thrilled in the middle of confusion or heartache or frustration to have somebody come up to me and say, God's working good in it. I just wanna say stop talking because I'm living the struggle, I'm living the suffering, I'm living the pain. Don't tell me about God's goodness when what I feel right now is anything but good. However, in all things, in all things, God is working good. In all things. In this room, there are many who have suffered loss. Loss before loss should have happened. And as I've learned the stories, and I've learned, and I've heard, this is, this is so amazing, I've, I've had the pleasure of hearing about God's nearness during that loss and the moments after and the healing and the peace and the comfort that God has brought. And I can say, I wouldn't say it in the moment, but I can say today, God worked good in them. And so what does that mean? It means that those who suffered loss before loss should have been suffered have more of the character of Jesus that has been worked in them. And so the way that they engage others who are going through pain, there is a grace and a kindness and a compassion that looks a whole lot like Jesus that would have not otherwise been worked in them had they not gone through the in all things, God works the good. So what's the point here of being in Christ, calling you dad, having the spirit in me, still living in the reality of suffering and hardship? We are being refined. What doesn't need to be there is supposed to be getting burned off. So that when we're ready to go, we're, we're ready because we, we're, we look like Jesus. 
And he goes on and he says this, those, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. What, what God predetermined is that in this, this life that we live, that we would be conformed to the likeness of his son. That's what was predetermined. So who did God foreknow? Everybody. So what was his predetermined plan? His, the, the predetermined hope that our heavenly dad has is that as we go through difficult days, that stuff gets burned off of us. Where we once would handle things in fits of rage, we now handle them with fits of grace. Where we once would just spout off or where we would just retaliate or take like vengeance would be ours. Now we came across that scripture that says, don't fight with anybody because vengeance is mine. Let, like, let me take care of you like a dad takes care of a son. And so we, we, we become conformed to the image of Jesus. And that doesn't happen on a rainbow road. It happens through heartache and suffering and the things that keep us up at night, the things that cause tears, the thing, you know that, that, that way that your heart or your stomach or your throat, I don't know how they're all tied together, but there's just moments where it's like, I feel like there's something in there that just, oh, I don't, I don't like this. And while I don't like this, just burn off anything that doesn't need to be there. I'm rendered, uh, I'm confused. I'm rendered speechless. My prayers will probably, be, like in my mind, they just seem like garbage. So I'm just gonna trust the Holy Spirit will kind of rework them and then send those prayers in intercession to the Father. And he, he strings, like listen to the, the, the intent behind what he's writing here is to demonstrate the extent of God's good work within us. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And so real time right now, Paul writes that as if the glorifying work that is yet to happen has already happened. So right now we have a taste of new life. Eventually, when our bodies give way, we're going to step into, we're gonna cross a threshold where we step fully into God's glory. And I wish there was like a less churchy word because sometimes, I've been a part of churches where people are like, oh, glory, and all along I'm like, I don't know what that means. It just must mean a reality that is so hard to wrap words around that glory is the only expression that we have. Full of God's goodness, full of God's grace, full of his smile, full of his delight, absent of pain and heartache and disappointment, but only full of God's goodness. That is the glory that we live our best in now while still knowing that we've not fully stepped into it. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, of those who love him. So what's the mandate on our life? Love God. I know it sounds so elementary, doesn't it? But how difficult is it to love God in the throes of seasons of life that are really hard? And the older I get, I wanna, there are so many in this room, by the way, that I've, I've just knowing some, like I, I can talk about uh, Nick Jinko because he's not in here. He came to the first service. But no, Nick had a, um, a, a uh, some kind of a node on his uh, vocal cords. It was cancer. And then he got treatment for it. Um, I, I wish we could do this like every Sunday where I just tell you the reports of like no cancer. Like it's just so cool to watch God move. So recently, within the last month, Nick Jenko received a report that there's no, no cancer. 
Like it's just so cool, right? And so the, the, uh, the part about his story that is applaud worthy is how close he chose to walk with Jesus through the process. And he and I were on similar timelines. I'm going through my stuff and I didn't do it like Nick. And so I say this, that the older I get, the more tethered to Jesus I want to be in my hard seasons. Because I can't afford to not keep becoming like Jesus. And so, this morning, I want to invite you to go grab your grow card. It's not going to be a question as much as it is going to be f- completing a sentence. So much of, of this process is, is living the song, really every song that we sang at the front end. But I, I love the song where we just speak the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus. And so in this room right now, I, I don't want you to talk yourself out of like, okay, well, other people have a struggle that's more than my struggle, and so I'm, I'm not gonna write it down. No, struggle is struggle. Suffering is suffering. Heartache is heartache, okay? Here's the statement that I would encourage us to, to finish. I speak Jesus over and then finish the sentence. And the reason why I want us to do that this morning is because what you write, you're acknowledging a suffering that is intended to cause you to become more like Jesus. Remember, in all things, God works for the good, and that good work that he's working is for you to become conformed to the image of his son. So when we say, I speak Jesus over, because I, we have a lot of different um, examples of law enforcement in here. Hey, law enforcement guys and ladies, what a mind bend if the onslaught that you are exposed to is not intended to, co- to, to create cynicism, but through all that you're exposed to, you become more like Jesus. What, like, talk about reworking what happens to typical officers. So you guys are exposed to all kinds of heartache and struggle and suffering. I think it would be amazing at the end of your tenure of being in law enforcement that you are not jaded, but you're like Jesus. And that you've been able to bring yourself into the communities that you serve and that you drive around your beat and you bring Jesus. Not hopeless cynicism. See how different that is? I can preach that because I'm not hired by any law enforcement. I'm not like paid staff or anything. But what if, what if each of us in the unique reality, the unique spot that you're living in, the different exposures to struggle, if we viewed that as God's design to conform us into the image of his son. So I speak Jesus over and fill in the blank. I'm gonna give like a minute or so, maybe you've been writing, but I'm gonna stop talking now that you have some, so that you can have some silence and respond to that, finish that sentence.
Heavenly Dad, every statement that is written this morning, both first service and this service, every statement where it's finished that I speak Jesus over, I pray that there is, from this point moving forward, that there is evidence of your Holy Spirit at work within us. Every situation that we speak Jesus over, we understand that we might be paralyzed to the point where we can't pray, but we know that we, the Spirit within us is praying according to your will. These statements that so easily cause frustration, heartache, disappointment. Now, we see them as a way forward to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that this prayer would not be a prayer of frustration because seldom have I ever met somebody that's going through a frustrating season and be delighted to say, hey, Jesus, God's working something good in you. But I do pray that there would be a change that happens in the way that we walk through the things that we suffer. And that it's not bitterness or hopelessness, discontent, even doubt. None of those words is what's happening within us, but we are becoming more like Jesus. And so as we are about to walk out of here in a few minutes, let us see each of our struggle in that light. And so with all of that, we speak Jesus over every situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, what an incredible morning, church, right? It's been good worship, a good message this morning. Hey, before we send you out of here, I have just a couple of things that I want to put in front of you. Friday was the first official day, first day of fall. And so we've got a bunch of fall things that are coming up here. One of those being in just a couple weeks, we are going as a church to um, Schuster's Pumpkin Patch out in Elyria after church. Um, that's for everyone, not just for the kids. And so um, we are covering the cost of hay rides, different things that will be available for the kids. But there will also be a food truck out there if you'd like to purchase lunch or bring a lunch. We're going to be hanging out there after church on October 15th. And the next Sunday, to continue some of the fall things, we are throwing a baptism party. Right? Anytime we have baptisms here at Grow Point, it is an all out party. And so we're looking forward to that next week. If that is something that you're interested in, being baptized next Sunday, we would love to have more conversation with you. You can um, sign up on your Grow card for that. And the party continues after service. We have a. Um, a coffee truck coming next Sunday. So if you like coffee like I do, they've got gourmet coffees. We'll post their uh, their menu on social media this week so you can be thinking ahead. But we'll have um, pumpkins out front if you want to wear your fall flannels to get a family photo, whatever that looks like for you. But would you stand um, with me this morning? It's been an incredible time with you in worship in the word today. Say good morning to someone on your way out. We will see you next Sunday for our baptism Sunday. We love you, church. Be blessed.